Hi everyone, welcome to Five Quotes Shakespeare Othello. Today we're going to look at character. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe and consider making a small donation to my Patreon account. First up, of course, is the noble Othello. Um, in this version, he's played by Willard White. Um, it's, it's a 1990 version. It's a little bit older, but it's fantastic. It says Willard White, who's actually a, um, he's actually an opera singer. He's not really an actor at all, although he's trained as an actor, as an, as an opera singer. Uh, he does a fantastic job, and Ian McKellen is alongside him as his counterpart, the, the, opposite, the opposite counterpart of, um, of Iago. Fantastic production. Please, I, I do recommend you watch it. Um, anyway, so the thing we have, to, we have to know about Othello is that Shakespeare takes great pains to depict him as a great guy in sharp contrast to the horrible man that Iago is. Now, I frame this in terms of the old Greek personification of, the, of, of, of humanity, of, of the dual nature of, of human nature. We have our noble qualities and we have our, our, our ignoble qualities, the underpowers. The god Apollo, of course, represents all of the, the, the wonderful things like art and beauty and the intellect and reason and all of those faculties. The under faculties, the under powers are represented by the god Dionysus, the god of wine and revels and, and, and bodily pleasures and things like that, the material. Now, what the ancient Greeks understood as personified in these gods, if you have too much of one, you're, you're, you're in trouble. You're, you're a half creature and you have real psychic problems. If you're all the other, you'll have problems in the opposite direction. You're a beast if you're all this, and you're some kind of weird prig like Hamlet if you're too much of that. Very, very interesting. Now, in this play, we see the same dynamic being worked out, I think, in these two characters. You will see the first half of the play demonstrates that, 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 that Othello is indeed this Apollonian figure. He's sophisticated, he's worldly, he's intelligent, witty, competent. Listen to that first, as we walk through the play, in future videos, as we walk through the play, I'm gonna show you all of these different, these, these places where he does demonstrate his intelligence, his competence, his nobility. He's quite literally a, 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 of royal blood, so, so Shakespeare throws that in there for no accidental reason. He's very gracious, he's elegant, he's eloquent, he's very well-spoken, and he's very, very charming. We like him, he's a fantastic guy. He's also brave, so it, the, the, all of these qualities could, could suggest that he's kind of a softy, but he's not. He's not soft at all. He's incredibly competent, as I've said. He's brave, tough, stoical, professional. He's a warrior, and he's called upon by the, by the, by the, by the, the leaders of Venice to save a, a, a major, a major um, asset in the Venetian Empire, Cyprus. He's proud, he's confident in his achievements. Look at this, this is in the opening of the play. He's looking down his detractors. He's staring a racist in the face and he's saying, come at me, bro, is what he's saying. He's really, really confident. He's a fantastic guy. However, this being a tragedy, he must have a tragic flaw and it really, really is tragic because you see once he starts to crack through the whole play, this is what happens in all tragedies, of course. Once the hero starts to crack, because of the tragic flaw, we're, 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 we're almost screaming back at this, uh, inwardly screaming at the screen, don't do it, don't go there, don't go there, you're better than this, you're better than this, you're better than this. But of course, our tragic flaws lead us to, um, to our own destruction, one of the other great themes that I talk about in my previous video. So he is good natured, he's apt to see the best in people. He calls honest Iago, honest Iago, because that's what he sees. He sees in him, Iago depicts himself very cleverly as an honest guy, so he has no reason, he's not a cynic. He's not cynical. He see, he's got, he's a good, he's, he's got um, goodness in him and he projects that goodness outwards, do you see? Um, which is not necessarily a fault, except when it is. Um, I'll, we're gonna show in future characters, Desdemona, all good, all good, to the point of, of dangerous naivete. You'll see that. Othello, not so much dangerous naivete, but it's these other qualities, his insecurity as an outsider. Racism plays a big role in this play, of course, and he is his awareness of his own outsider status among uh, the, the Venetian gentry uh, makes him insecure and makes him vulnerable to the manipulations of a jerk like this guy. Um, a tragic flaw is also his jealousy, and I, I think that comes more from his insecurity. If he hadn't been triggered, if, if his, his status as an outsider hadn't triggered, been triggered by Iago to make him jealous, I don't think he would have been jealous. I think he was very trusting, as I said, very trusting and, and of, of, of Desdemona, who demonstrated nothing but her own trustworthiness. 
He is passionate, violent, and hot-tempered, and that might be a more standalone. I don't think that's a standalone tragic flaw, if you know what I mean. I think that is is is. I think that is a result of his insecurity based on on his outsider status in Venice. That might be standalone. I think he is quite passionate. He gets really really angry when some nonsense happens uh, um, among the troops. He comes in and like a like a really like a hot-headed father, he kind of scolds his uh, his his underlings, and so maybe that's that standalone. So that's one of that's one of his tragic flaws too. Otherwise, a fantastic guy. Um, stick around. We'll 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 compare him very shortly. We'll compare him to um, Iago, and Iago does not come off looking very good in comparison. But first, Desdemona. Shakespeare takes great pains as well to depict her as, as, as a great person, okay? Um, maybe to a fault. Uh, one of the criticisms I have generally of the character of Desdemona is she, she, she's kind of annoying. She's so perfect. She might be too perfect. Um, and, and one of the reasons I think Shakespeare makes her this perfect, almost unbelievably perfect, but not quite, and I'm going to try to prove that in this play. Uh, well, one reason mechanically Shakespeare does this is just to create pathos. He wants to create, he wants to evoke uh, um, the tragic emotions uh, in that final scene. And so if, if she's this wonderful, wonderful, innocent, purely, purely innocent uh, woman who's getting murdered by Othello, then the, the deed seems much more monstrous than if she's a real complex, fleshed out human being. Um, that said, uh, th there's a lot that we can admire about her. Um, she's definitely a, a, a Juliet figure. Um, Shakespeare liked Juliet figures, I think. She, he liked tough, independent women who could stand up to tyrants. And just like Juliet stands up to her father in that in Romeo and Juliet, Desdemona stands up to her father and says, "No, I love I, I love you, father, but I love I love Othello, and my future is with my husband. My future is not with my father." That's very very wise. She also she also says all of this uh, in front of the Duke. She's she's in front of a panel of the highest powered authorities in all of Venice, and she stands up there and like Othello, she stares down her detractors, in this case her father, and says, uh, "No, I am who I am, and I have to do what I have to do because of who I am." So very very noble and and tough minded, and we admire her for that for sure. She's very clever. Go watch her scene. We'll come come back to my other videos, and we'll we'll walk through that scene, and we'll see how she stands up for herself cleverly, very very intelligently, not just brave but also clever. As I just mentioned, she is an Apollonian figure. She loves. She actually says straight up that I fell in love for Othello for his mind. Okay, cleverly though, Shakespeare throws this in here. Not cleverly. I mean, what? It's just a. It's just genius. A genius understanding of what it means to be human. The complexity of it means to be human. She is Apollonian. She is this purity. However, she's not prudish. Uh, she also enjoys Othello for his his body as well, and that's quite evident in the play. So come back as I walk through the through the text, and we'll and we'll see that. So she is she is she has the higher and lower powers balanced in her in the same way that Othello does, which we'll talk about later. Uh, unlike uh, someone like Iago, who is all lower powers and nothing higher. So as I said, she is good, pure, innocent. Are these noble qualities? You should be good, you should be pure, you should be innocent. Yeah, really? That inexperience makes her a fool. And that's part of the problem. She, like Othello, Othello for other reasons as I've talked about, she buys everything that Iago says. She's unquestioningly questioningly good about everything. She projects onto the world what she has inside of her, which is absolute purity. I think, she's a, I think she was very, very sheltered. She's a sheltered, noble daughter of an aristocrat, uh, who who has had a, a decent childhood? She, obviously, she if she's so naive, she must have had a decent father. When he was able to play play the father role, he gave her no reason to become suspicious of men. Do you see what I mean? Or suspicious of people? Um, I think she's she's very very sheltered, and those sheltered people become very very annoying. Now, when we look at the character of of Amelia, she's the polar opposite of of um, Desdemona. Not that she's bad. Amelia's not evil, but she's experienced. She's had she's she's in a, a horrible marriage, and she knows what humans are like, men especially, unlike the naive uh, Desdemona. Uh, she's very loyal. Again, one of those noble qualities. She, she's very lo loyal to to Cassio, and she goes to the wall to help Cassio regain his position in in in, in life as a friend, uh, even to the point of 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 going too far and, and thereby creating suspicion in Othello's mind that she's having an affair with Cassio. So again, she, she doesn't see, she doesn't see what her actions evoke in other people because she's so pure. She doesn't see any, any, any possibility of, 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 of badness coming out of her goodness.
Good natures, apt, good natured, apt to see the best in people, therefore naive, therefore too trusting, easily manipulated by Iago and others. Um, we could also think of it as, uh, as as containing a shadow, the 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 Jungian shadow. I talk about that in my theme video. Go have a look, and I'm going to talk about it as we walk through the play. Uh, you have to you have to, if you have to have a bit of darkness in you in order to recognize the darkness in others. Harry Potter, Harry Potter could speak parcel tongue. Harry Potter was a snake. Harry Potter had evil in him, and therefore he was the only one who could confront true evil, which is Voldemort, of course. She has zero shadow, and we have zero shadow. You can't recognize evil, and so you are an absolute victim, victim. She's, she's absolutely helpless when she encounters a villain, a pure snake like Iago. Iago is one of literature's truly great villains, uh, and I think it's it's deserving. I've I've heard it said one of the criticisms of Iago is that he's kind of a cartoonish villain. He's just too perfectly good. In the same way that I've heard it said that she's just too perfectly perfect, um, I, I don't I don't think that's fair. I really don't. If we look really carefully at at, at the, the the hints and the subtleties of language that Shakespeare builds into the play, we can really see real human motivations. A cartoonish villain is just all of a sudden magically evil, magically purely evil, and you don't see how, as a human, how that human could become evil. Do you see what I mean? But we see it. We see it. Shakespeare is smarter than that, and he lays it all out. I've divided this uh, this character into two two sections. One, generally Iago as, as the man, but also I'd like, you, you should also be able to trace Iago as quite clinically a psychopath, and I took all of these things here from a website uh, definition of of, of clinical psychopathology. So, so we'll, we'll have a look, quick look at that too. All right, so as I mentioned, he is the Dionysian figure and you can see that in his language. He's always, he's base, which means low and crude. He's vulgar, he's crude. He understands the world only in terms of sex and money. Now look at the language. He's constantly talking about money, constantly talking about sex, those two, those two forces. He's got none of the Apollonian in, in him and all of the Dionysian. Sex is not bad, money's not bad, but when that's all you are and you've got nothing else going for you, then, then, you're, then you're, you're beastly, you're pure Dionysian. Uh, strangely, and this is, part of, this is part of the complexity, this is what makes him not cartoonish. He's a complex character, likable, charismatic. He's the life of the party. If you knew Iago, you would probably love having him around. He'd be the funnest guy at the party. He'd be the class clown. Everybody would like him, even the teachers. He's clever. He's witty. He likes a good joke. He dupes everybody. That's, that's part of what a psychopath can do, is that they're, they're, they're highly duplicitous and very clever at concealing who they truly are. And they're very clever at gaining people's favor, getting into their good books so that they're, they're, they're vulnerable once, once they trust you. Uh, he's very, very cynical. He's apt to see the worst in people. Now, that's a major theme that I talk about in my other video on theme, is we see what we want to see, we see what we, we expect to see, the projection that we saw with Desdemona. She's got all good in her, so she sees only good in other people. She, it's impossible for her to see bad. Same thing with him. It's impossible for he, him to see good in other people. Not once in the entire play does he say anything sincerely nice about anybody else. He is pure corruption, and he sees pure corruption in everybody else. Nasty, really, really nasty. Um, I'm going to use the word uh, bigoted instead of racist, although he certainly is racist. But I think it's more interesting to say he's bigoted because it makes him more complex. And what bigoted means versus racist is that he just hates anybody who's not himself. It's the in-group, out-group thing. Everybody in my out-group is, is, is horrible, and in my in-group, uh, everybody is great. A psychopath, however, only has one person in their in-group, and that's themselves. They're so, they're so um, uh, viciously... Uh, narcissistic. Uh, I say this because he, he's also very critical of the Florentines, he's dismissive of the Florentines. Cassio is from Florence and he hates these Florentines. Do you see what I'm saying? So just like he hates black people, he hates the Florentines, he hates anybody who's not on his in-group, which means anybody but himself. Uh, venal, he's, he's, he's corrupt, he's money-grubbing. Again, that goes back to the Dionysian element, the, 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 the crudely Dionysian element. All he thinks of is money. He keeps, tell, he keeps telling Rodrigo, who he's trying to manipulate, he says, put money in your purse, sell all your land, sell all your property, put money in your purse so you can give it to me, put money in your purse. That's all he thinks about. Now, this probably for me is the most interesting facet of the whole play, actually, is the concept of resentment, okay? The old um, Nietzschean notion of raison temant, okay? Uh, look this stuff up. It's really, really, really nasty stuff. And he is an embodiment of resentment. When a person goes, when, when, when resentment settles, starts to settle in the soul, it, it, it sours it, it pollutes it, and, and, and it can lead to, to, to really, really horrible results, uh, including burning down 
nations and continents. World War II was the result of that kind of resentment. It's really, really horrible. Resentment, he's, he, he's resentful, bitter, cowardly, which makes him even more dangerous because he can't see it coming. If someone was going around with a sour face, I oh, know you suck and you suck and you suck, you know that that guy is a dangerous character, so he's on your radar. Not so Iago. He is this life of the party guy. He is very, very likeful, li likable and charming, and so we can't see it. We can't see it coming. He blames others for his own failures and inadequacy, inadequacies. One of the quotes early in the play, he said he, he criticizes Cassio because Cassio got promoted uh, above above him. That's part of the resentment uh, issue. He says Cassio hath a beauty in his life that makes me ugly. Look at that. He recognizes here it's in a soliloquy, so he's actually talking to himself, and and he hates Cassio not because of anything inherently wrong with Cassio. In fact, Cassio is a great guy. Cassio is a better guy than this guy. That's why. We hate people. We hate people who are better than us. We want to burn those people down because their noble qualities make us feel ashamed of ourselves. Nasty, really, really nasty stuff. Uh, the, that, the nastiest. I can't think of anything worse and more dangerous than that kind of resentment. Uh, duplicitous, passive aggressive. Uh, he hates people. He wants to say things nasty to their face, but he can't. He hides himself away. Uh, the only time that he's openly aggressive is when he is picking on weak people. He is certainly the bully and he picks on his wife because she's obviously got some serious um, personality problems in terms of, of self-esteem and those problems. And Rodrigo is just a pathetic, pathetic worm of a man. And so he, he's openly aggressive uh, with these people. Actually, not so much with, with, uh, with Rodrigo, uh, although occasionally, more so with his wife. Uh, very, very narcissistic. Uh, psychopaths are. Part of psychopathology is narcissism, and he can't stand the thought of the attention and respect that Othello and Cassius, Cassio uh, receive throughout the play. They do. Everybody likes Cassio. He's a really nice guy. Desdemona loves him. Everybody respects him. Uh, even his wife uh, likes him, demonstrates affection for him, I think. Um, worst, though, of course, is that this outsider, this black man, has the nerve to gain the respect and attention of uh, Venice's nobility and be promoted and be in a much more powerful position than this, this guy. Uh, as I said, he's very, very intelligent and you can't be a good psychopath <laughs> unless you're smart. Good psychopath, please don't misunderstand me. Uh, unless you're really, really smart, because you have, he has a good understanding of people. He recognizes, he's got this radar. A good psychopath is a predator, and they can look at a crowd, and they can pick out the weak ones, and they can pick out the, oh, he's got these characteristics, so I've got to be careful of those, or she's got those characteristics, and so therefore she's vulnerable. So that's what a psychopath does. They, they're smart. They're smart. And as I said, he's a bully. Okay, so let's look at psycho, the psychopathology of Iago. As I said, um, these, this, this is a straight-up condensed definition uh, of from Simply Psychology website of what a psychopath is. Um, you look it up yourself. Um, as we've already talked about, he's superficially charming. Uh, he's the life of the party. You would like him. You like to think that you're sitting there in the audience saying, oh, I hate that guy. I'd see right through him. You wouldn't. He, you, would, you, would, you would grapple him to your heart and bring him to every social event that you possibly could. And then he'd stab you in the back the second he had his chance. Grandiose sense of self-worth, that's another characteristic of the psychopath, and he certainly has that. Everybody that was promoted above him, he doesn't see the promotion of others as, yeah, they're, yeah, they're competent, they're good, yeah, they do a really good job, and they deserve that position. It's always like, no, it should have been me, it should have been me, I'm better than them. He, sa he actually he, he says that at the beginning of the play. Uh, pathological lying, of course, that's a literal definition of a psychopath, is that they just they lie uh, um, compulsively. Um, he... At the beginning of the play, it's a bit annoying. All of the characters say, Honest Iago, Honest Iago, Honest Iago. That's how they refer to Honest Iago. It's Honest Iago. And it, it, it's a little bit too much, I think. I think Shakespeare could have cut maybe half of the instances when people say that. But Shakespeare's driving home the point to the audience early in the play that everybody believes that he's honest. Well, where does that come from? From beginning to, from the time Iago entered these people's lives, however many years before the opening of the play, he he charmed the pants off them all do you see lying from day one that's how that's how pathological it is that's how 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 much of a, a sickness it is that's what pathological means uh 
related to that, of course, is that is he, he cons everybody he meets. He's very, very manipulative. Okay, he likes toying with people. That's part of this one as well. Uh, a psychopath is prone to boredom. Okay, they need constant stimulation, and that stimulation uh, uh, comes from uh, their, 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 their manipulation, the fun they have manipulating other people. And, and Iago actually says, he says, I use them for my sport. And he's talking about uh, Rodrigo, I believe, uh, and, and also, and also uh, Othello. Um, yeah, it's sport. Look for that word in text. Uh, they're incapable, of course. They're, they're biologic. I read somewhere they're biologically. There might be new research on this because I read it a long time ago. But they're biologically incapable of remorse or guilt. There, there, there's a mechanism that we're born with that that's the that the empathy center. Do you see the empathy empathy center of the brain wherever it is? These psychopaths are born without it. So it's almost like a Blade Runner, you know, robot kind of situation. The android is incapable of that kind of emotion. Um, emotionally shallow, very, very emotionally shallow. Um, failure to accept responsibility for our their own actions. Okay, it's all somebody else's fault. All somebody else's fault, and that's what we hear constantly throughout the play. All of this is established very, very early in the first one third of of the uh, of, of the text. Okay, so there's Iago, the psychopath. At first glance, Cassio can seem kind of one-dimensional. He's just a nice guy that gets taken out by Iago conveniently. Uh, I don't think so, though. If you look closely at, at what he does and what he says and his, his, his actions, he's actually kind of weird. He's a weird guy. I don't quite know where to place him. I don't know if I like him or not, honestly. Uh, um, so hats off to Shakespeare, Shakespeare for, for never, never letting us rest. Um, th these guys are not cartoon characters in the same way that, that uh, Desdemona's goodness is, is complicated by other aspects of, 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 her, of her personality and personal history. Um, he is Othello's uh, lieutenant, which means his right-hand man, and he was chosen for that position, I believe, because of his strong sense of professionalism. That becomes very, very obvious throughout the play. Uh, he's got a strong sense of duty, and when he makes a terrible mistake uh, and, he, and, and, and he's disgraced his, his, as a profession, he loses his reputation, he's, he's devastated. So that sense of professionalism and duty is hardwired into his personality. Um, and, it, and it's tough when he loses it. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, he, he is very, very good natured. He's apt to see the best in people. Therefore, he's potentially naive, and he is. He's too trusting. He's easily manipulated by, by, by Iago. In that way, he's, he's the counterpart of, of Desdemona. I believe he's got an underdeveloped, weak shadow. Uh, because he, he's not all good, he's not all good. He's got he's got something in him, but it it, it doesn't get expressed well. Uh, it, he doesn't like Othello. Has got the shadow ready to go. He's he's got he's got toughness ready to go. He can stare down people that he knows want to do him ill. He can stare them down. He he has a harder time doing it when he gets drunk. Is when he does that, and that suggests to me a repressed shadow, and it awkwardly emerges at the wrong time. You know, it, it, it's a person who 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 he, he wants to say something, but they can't, and they keep stifling it. And so, at these weird moments, it just pops out of nowhere. Uh, weird character. He's a strange character. I don't know if I like him or not. Um, He's, he, he comes across as, as too nice. He comes across, especially in this version, in the 1990, 1990 Trevor Nunn production, he, Trevor Nunn depicts him as this too nice friend zone kind of guy. Um, clingy, clingy and needy. He's got a weak sense of self, I think, and he requires validation from others. Now, if you think about the play, if you should have watched the version already, if not the, the 1990 version, you should have watched the version already. During the drinking challenge, he, he says, no, 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 I, I'm, not, I'm not a good drinker. I've already had the drink tonight. I don't need another one. If he had a tough sense of self, if he knew what he wanted and, and, how to, and how to say what he wanted, how to say no to others, he can't say no to others. He'd just say, no, I don't want another drink. But he falls into that trap. That's his tragic flaw. If he hadn't fallen into that drinking challenge trap, then none, none of this disaster would have happened. He wouldn't have lost his position. Uh, his reputation, when he loses, when he does lose his reputation because of his his, his ridiculous actions when he's drunk, these weird, uh, uh, repressive, repressed shadow actions, um, he loses his reputation and and he it, it it cracks him to pieces. A psychopath or a person with a stronger self sense of self perhaps would say, well, my reputation, I don't care, I'll build it back, I'll build it back. I don't care what people think of me. I don't care what my reputation is. I don't care what public opinion thinks of me. I'll build, I'll build it back on my own merits. But no, he starts whining, my reputation, my reputation, my reputation, to the point of being annoying. These two are quite annoying. They're the heroes. They're the good people in the play, but Shakespeare makes them annoying. Why? 
interesting. Isn't that cool that Shakespeare does that? The good people are annoying. What do you do with that? I don't know. That's life, I suppose. Uh, he needs to impress Iago. Here's this scumbag who, well, nobody thinks he's a scumbag. They all think he's honest Iago. But when, when, Ia, when Iago um, 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 prods him to mock his concubine, his, 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 his kept woman is what Bianca basically is. When Iago taunts him to, to mock in the crudest, crudest terms uh, this woman that, 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 that Cassio's having a, a, an affair with, a crude affair. Here, where we go, if he's such a nice friend zone guy, he's having a crude affair with that's only based on sexuality. You can see that quite clearly. Uh, we can talk about this now, his hypocrisy. He toys with and then cruelly to impress a guy, a guy who, who, who mocks a woman or mocks anybody just to impress a bro, just to impress a friend, is not really a nice guy. And yet he's supposed to be the nice guy of the play. Do you see how complex it is? I don't know. I don't know what to think of this guy. I really don't. Um, in that drunk scene, when he is drunk and, 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 and alcohol releases the inhibitions, and so we, our true nature tends to emerge when we're, when we're intoxicated like that, uh, a puritanical, snobby, arrogant streak comes out in him. And he says, I'm not drunk. I'm not drunk. And everybody should stop this revel. Stop this singing and dancing and drinking. This is beneath us. This is beneath me, he says, do you see? So he is, he's unlikable in many, many ways. Um, perhaps he comes across like this to mask his own insecurities. He's very much a beta male. And the actor here, he's, he, he's kind of the beta male actor, uh, especially in comparison to the tough uh, um, a character of Iago and even, uh, not, I mean, Othello and maybe even Iago. So he, he is a bit of a fool as well. And I think the fool comes from being good natured and naive. He just opens his mouth and says, the he has no filter is what we say. He has no filter. He says what comes to his mind in a very childlike, naive way, which can be charming because he's speaking from the heart. But it gets him into big, big trouble, of course, because that's not the way ad the adult world uh, works. So there you go, Cassio, not just a nice guy, quite complex and creepy. I don't know, you decide. Amelia is another one of those characters. The, this play is full of them. Another one of these characters that on first glance, she's one dimensional. She's simply the abused wife. And she certainly is. She's the battered wife. And you could look into Shakespeare. Shakespeare leaves a lot in the background of things. He just shows us what we see on the streets, what we see in our workplaces, the people that we see. He just shows us them as they are. He doesn't go into the backstories to reveal how they got there. Although all of that history comes with them just by, meet, you meet a person on the street and they are who they are because of their backstory, their DNA, of course, but also the way they, their, their environment when they were growing up, that all comes with them. And when we meet those people, we don't have access to that. All we have, are, all we have access to are the hints and clues that they give us in their behaviors and their language to tell, if, to tell us where they come from and, and how they got to the, where they are. So the big question here that we have is she's clearly an abused wife, a battered wife. And we ask ourselves, how did she get there? Well, the obvious answer is I, I'm not an expert in this, of course. We could, we, you, we could go and look it up. She obviously has some kind of sense of a low self-worth. Um, I deserve abuse and therefore I'm going to stay with this creep even though he abuses me. She's fearful and she's weak and, and the reasons for that are what uh, science is revealing that it has a lot to do with personality types which has a lot to do with DNA so we can be born more timid than other people but of course it must have also something to do with her background. I assume, I mean a person like that, I assume that person had a terrible father growing up and or a terrible mother, DC. So uh, again, very, very interesting. Shakespeare gives us these characters and all their complexity, but he doesn't explain it. Uh, so she is cynical, bitter, distrustful of men, of people generally, maybe, I don't know, but in this, in, it's mostly directed towards men. And fair enough, she's, she obviously comes from this kind of uh, abusive relationship from her, her parents, uh, certainly the father, I would guess, although some mothers can be nasty too, so, so who knows. This is, this is actually quite interesting. She, she like a lot of what Shakespeare does is, is Shakespeare will take different characters and he'll put them against each other. And so they play off each other either as foils or as counterparts or some variation of the two. And she's very much a foil, a character foil of Desdemona. Desdemona being the pure, innocent, uh, 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 idealistic person, naive. She, Desdemona sees she projects onto everybody else the, the, the goodness that's in her, the naivete that's in her. She does the exact opposite. She, 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 she functions as the counterweight to that. And so when they, have, when they have a conversation together, after Desdemona falls out with, with Othello, 
the, the two women are talking together and it's a very, very tender moment. It's a very, very interesting moment. There's the voice of, of, of bitter wisdom coming from Amelia advising the, 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 the sheltered, naive girl do you see it's a lovely lovely scene go have a close look at that um it's 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 absolutely gorgeous um this however uh threw me for a loop when i first had a look of it a look at it this is what i mean by how complex things get when you start digging deeper i you start asking yourself questions it's like oh my goodness what's going on here is she subconsciously resentful of desdemona's happiness probably probably her life is total crap, total crap. And she's looking at this other girl, this younger, younger, but the same. Anyway, happy, happy, happy. From the beginning of the play, she's beaming and she's not shy about her beaming. Desdemona is just oozing happiness. Isn't life great? Isn't life great? Isn't life great? And this person over here whose life ain't great has to look at that every day. Wouldn't that drive you crazy? Wouldn't that make you resentful? And there we go back to that grand theme of resentfulness dangerous, dangerous thing. So my question is, the deal with the handkerchief, why on earth, if she is so cynical and distrustful of men, and she must know what kind of guy Iago is, why on earth would she give Desdemona's handkerchief to the husband who has been asking for it, the, the, the brutalizing husband who's been asking for it? Why does she do it? Does she try subconsciously, it, does she give the handkerchief to Iago, hoping at some dark, dark, dark level in her soul that it sabotages Desdemona's happiness. I betcha, I betcha, it's really, really interesting. Otherwise, she's just stupid. If she, if she knows that her husband is capable of doing bad things, and she is, then why on earth would she, would she do it unless she's stupid? Uh, the other example that is not satisfactory at all, the other, the other answer is that is not satisfactory at all is that, that it's just Shakespeare's convenient plot device. All right, fair enough. It's a bit, it's a bit cheesy. Shakespeare has to get the handkerchief into Desdemona's hands. Oh, sorry, um, into into Cassio's hands. No, he could have did it. He could have done it another way. As a plot device, Shakespeare could have found. You know, he could have just had somebody's handkerchief falling down. It didn't have to come from Emilia, but he had it come from Emilia. Amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. Amazing character development. Uh, her in Oshad, she is weak. And all throughout the play, through the whole play, she's weak and passive and weak and passive, more or less, more or less, more or less. Uh, uh, she can't stand up to her for herself in any situation except at the very, very end. Her, her undeveloped shadow emerges with a vengeance and she lashes out when she sees that it's too late, of course, when she sees that, that, uh, that uh, what her husband has done with the handkerchief and what she, by implication, has done, direct implication has done, uh, she, her shadow lashes out. And she reveals all, and she has her moment of standing forthrightly in front of everyone and saying exactly and honestly what she believes. Everybody else had that at the beginning of the play. Uh, uh, Desdemona and, and Othello had that at the beginning of the play. She doesn't have her moment until the end of the play. It comes on strong, and it is it is it is noble. It is she 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 redeems herself, I suppose, at the end. Questionably, I suppose, because it comes much much too late. So. Think about that. Think about that. It's very, very interesting. Um, Shakespeare never lets us rest with characters. That's for sure. Of all the main characters in the story, I suppose Rodrigo is the is the most one dimensional. Although at the end he does he he writes a nasty letter revealing uh, the truth about what Iago has done. So he does man up uh, towards the end of it, which goes against his nature as we see it throughout most of the play. So he is he's got a bit of complexity, but not too much. Uh, he he's the gullible fool. He's for some reason he's he's obsessively in love with Desdemona, and it's not quite clear why he would be that obsessive. What would make a person throw away their entire fortune, their entire life, for someone who is clearly out of reach? What would make him do that? There's something really flawed in his character, and I, I, I don't know I don't know what it is. Leave some comments uh, if you have any idea. Uh, he does have a terribly weak, underdeveloped shadow. He he cannot stand up to to Iago, even though. Foolishly, he should he sh he should see uh, what Iago's doing. He's he's given literally he's given away his entire estate, his entire worth, economic worth to to this guy who's producing no results whatsoever. So he must have there's something really bad about his character. There's something really weak about his character. Low sense of self worth. He is a racist. He come he comes across as a racist. Um, uh, like 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 all of the bad guys in this story, uh, they they do have that. Uh, um, 
um, bigotry in them. Immature, childish, in this 1991 version, uh, uh, Trevor Nunn has him literally throwing a temper tantrum when he can't get Desdemona. So I think there's Trevor Nunn, the director, trying to figure out what's going on in this guy, what would make him so ridiculously obsessive about, uh, about Desdemona. So there's something wrong with his character. I don't, I don't know what it is, though. I don't know. No, I can't Clinically, I can't identify it. But uh, not a terribly interesting character, except off, off stage, after he dies, they, a letter is revealed. And in the letter, he actually mans up. But it's not until after his death. So again, much, much, much too late. Like Rodrigo, Brabantio, Desdemona's father, is somewhat one-dimensional. We don't have to go into too much detail with him, but there is, there, there is, a, there is a hint of, of, of something more complex under, under that simple surface. Simply, of course, he's the overbearing father. He's the Juliet father. Okay, there's, there's not much else going on. Uh, unless we think of him, if, unless we ask the question, well, what would make him so overbearing? What makes a father so overbearing? There's a couple of answers to it. And, and to be generous to him, we can think of him as an enmeshed father. Uh, what enmeshment means is when a, a, a parent and a child, the relationship is too closely connected. And so that their identities are bound together in a way that's not entirely healthy, that, that doesn't allow for the natural separation. The child has to get away from the parents at a certain age, and the parents have to get away from the kids at a certain age and go have their own healthy relationships with other adults, including their spouses, do you see? So is he enmeshed in that way, and therefore that is what makes him so overbearing? Um, perhaps, again, Shakespeare only shows us the creature he only so shows us the person that we meet in the office or on the bus or wherever. He only shows us that person, and we have to piece it all together ourselves. Uh, he's very, very reluctant to let go of his daughter. Uh, is it enmeshment uh, and it's just sadness and heartbreak that he can't, because she's so part of him, that it, to give her away would be to rip out a part of him? I think that's very plausible. I think that's very plausible. Uh, um, fathers and mothers and sons have a, have a hard time separating. Fathers and daughters have a hard time separating. It's not easy uh, at, at any, you know, for anybody. Uh, or is it mere ego? Is he just a bully? Is he just, I, I you know, you, what do you mean you're going to do something else without my, my approval? I am your boss, so you shall do as I command. Uh, that's that's probably even more likely, um, probably just as likely. I think there's probably a little bit of both in these things. You know, I, th I think that's the, uh, human beings are not all A or all B. They're usually a, a weird, irritating, frustrating, incomprehensible mix of all these things. Uh, he's certainly a racist. Now I'm going to add this to it. This is really complex as well. It's very interesting that Shakespeare built into this play. It, there's clear evidence. They actually say. Uh, Othello says that Brabantio very, very often invited Othello into his home and very much enjoyed his company as from gentleman to gentleman. And he and and Brabantio and uh, had Othello come over to entertain his family uh, with with uh, with talk of Othello's adventures. He he very much admired Othello. But do you see what I mean by soft racist? Um, it's true today in the world that many many countries. I've traveled a lot. And what, you, what, I, what I find personally is that at the superficial level, the, the people, the host country will be very, very welcoming to the foreigner. Very, very welcoming. They'll invite you into their home. They'll, they'll make you tea. They'll, 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 serve you, they'll serve you dinner. They'll show you around town. But if you step too close, if you, become, if you want to marry someone in that culture or in the family, or even if you become too knowledgeable about the host culture, it's like, wait a minute. No, 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 no. You're the out group. You're the guest. Stay in your guest zone. Don't get too close. So I'm going to suggest somewhat, somewhat weakly, it's not a strong argument, that he's a soft racist because he did admire Othello. It's not his, it's not his blackness that he, that he rejects. It's the fact that the other got too close, do you see what I mean, to his own culture by marrying his daughter, compounded by these other things as well. Let's say... Un uncharitably his ego and charitably uh, his, his, his too intense love for his daughter. Um, it's a very, very interesting concept. I don't know if soft racist is the correct term for it, but I bet you there is a term for something like that. Nevertheless, of course, he comes off very, very clearly at the beginning of the play as, as, as quite directly a racist. How dare this guy, this, my, my pure daughter marry this guy? Do you see? It, it pretty, it's pretty grotesque. He comes across as very, very foolish. And again, why did Shakespeare make this happen? Look at this. At the very beginning, when, 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 when there's a crisis, the generals, all the generals of, of Venice are, are at a crisis point. Uh, uh, Cyprus is, is, is under threat, and they call, they need this great hero, Othello, to come. And when they all arrive, 
uh, uh, he, the, the, the generals address Othello. They say, valiant Othello, we must straight employ you against the general enemy, the Ottoman. Come here, Othello. When, all, when everybody moves, it comes into the, into the war room. Okay, Othello, let's get to it. And then as an afterthought, as an afterthought, he says, oh, 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 Brabantio, I didn't see you there. Do you see what Shakespeare did? He had the generals diss him. Do you see? Again, it's a resentment moment. It's a moment where he is now humiliated. This other, okay, the fact that he's black makes it make makes the otherness worse, certainly. But this other is more prestigious in the eyes of these these uh, the, these important people than I am. Uh, complex. So in that sense, he is kind of. And then he comes blustering in about you know there's uh, we're being invaded. And he comes in blustering about how his, his, his daughter has is, is married somebody. So he, he's made to look quite ridiculous. And Shakespeare does that on purpose. Um, it's a great play. Yes, and so I, I just mentioned that. So he's threatened by Othello. It's not so much rise, I suppose. He's threatened by the already the risen Othello. He's already very much respected in the eyes of, of, of Venice's nobility. So again, somewhat superficial, but I never, I never, I never, I keep asking questions. When you encounter these characters in a great writer, don't just stay on the surface. The surface is true. He's, he's, he's racist and he's an overbearing father. Fine. If you want to understand it in those terms, fine. But that's a grade 10 understanding. Go higher, go higher, go deeper. Human beings are more complex than that. And that was five quote Shakespeare Othello character analysis. Come back for my next video and we'll dig into the text of Act 1, Scene 1. Thanks for watching.